Hello, I'm Harriet Whitting, and I'm talking with you about physiotherapy pain management in patients with chronic back pain. So how do we manage them? I came across this case study on the internet where a patient tells her own personal story about the number of professionals she's seen and the treatment she's had in the past. You can see on the right the number of people she's seen, physiotherapists, general practitioners, occupational therapists, consultants, rheumatologists, pain psychologists, and neurosurgeons, spinal surgeons, etc. By the time these patients come and see us, they are quite disappointed with the treatments they've had, when, especially when they're seeking pain relief. So what is our job in managing these patients? In 2019, we celebrated the physiotherapist's role in chronic pain as a theme in World Physical Therapy Day, and especially the role of exercise in chronic pain. And of course, the benefits of exercise are manifold. It helps increase flexibility, cardiovascular health, it increases strength, it helps with mood, increasing mood, it helps with pain management, and it helps taking control. But it really seems like rather a shotgun approach to exercise and the goals we have with our patients. And I was wondering if we can do something a little bit more targeted to the patient's needs. And I also think physios do more than just exercise and chronic pain management. We do employ a cognitive behavioral approach, including education. We teach patients pacing. We challenge their dysfunctional beliefs and we discover their physical abilities. We use relaxation techniques and we try to increase physical functioning of our patients and to attain valuable goals. We help patients manage exacerbations of their pain and we help patients self-manage the impact of pain on their mostly physical lives. The first generation cognitive behavioral therapy came from Wilbur Fordyce. He was a pain psychologist in Seattle, Washington State, and he was about operant conditioning. He felt as we can't measure pain objectively, we can look at pain behavior, and he felt that pain behavior is learned behavior, and that environmental factors determine the pain behavior. For instance, if your spouse rewards you for your pain behavior, it's likely to persist. Whereas if people punish you for your pain behavior, it's likely to extinguish. And that can lead to too little or too much physical activity. So what we need to do in our treatment is to reward healthy behaviors and ignore pain behaviors. So he also distinguishes pacers, the people who carry on despite increases in pain, and the recliners who avoid everything for fear of increasing pain. And from him, we got pacing to decrease overactivity and increase overall activity by better distributing activities over the day. Operant conditioning also includes the hurt versus harm principle, meaning that pain doesn't necessarily mean harm. The patients really need to understand that exercise, even if it increases their pain, doesn't cause them more harm. Pacing is important to distribute activities better over a day. Shaping helps in reinforcement of sub-goals of target behavior. And graded activity is something that is very useful in treating patients, especially when they're fearful. In graded activity, you start low for a positive experience to achieve the goals that you want. So you set a goal at the end of your treatment, you see what patients can do without pain exacerbation, and you get them to exercise or achieve their goals a little bit more every day. So they need to do their, house, their homework, um, even when they don't see you, and take little baby steps towards their goal. For instance, if somebody can walk for two minutes, you can increase by two minutes every week, and you can calculate how many steps a person needs to take each day in order to come to that goal. 
and eventually people then achieve the desired level of functioning. Important for them is to realize that they can't do more or less depending on how they feel. So even if they have a good day, they can't do more. And if they have a bad day, they still have to do their, their homework. This is to teach people that they can function despite how they feel. So what kind of goals would you set for therapy with your patients? And would you treat time contingent or pain contingent? And do you know what these terms mean? If you don't know what these terms means, mean, then look them up. Dennis Stuck represented the second generation cognitive behavioral therapy. And he says, um, thoughts about a situation also leads to feeling and behavior. And emotions and behavior can be changed by changing underlying thoughts. So what we need to do is challenge dysfunctional beliefs. And eventually the goal is to have a good life despite the pain people are experiencing. One way to find out about dysfunctional beliefs is to use the illness perceptions questionnaire. Most patients have questions about what it is that they have, what caused it, what the consequences are in the short term, but also in the long term, how long it will last, and what they can do or their healthcare providers to influence it. So we labeled those perceptions as identity, cause, consequences, timeline, and control. An example, I think I've presented you this case before, is about a case of a colleague of mine who saw this patient who complained about back pain. But she told the therapist to be really careful with her pelvis because she felt that her pelvis was very fragile. When the therapist said, how do you know it's very fragile? She said, I've seen the x-rays in the orthopedist's office. So he went and found x-rays of the pelvis on the internet and showed them to her and said, can you indicate what you mean by fragile? And she says, but I have holes in my pelvis. And he said, well, can you indicate to me where those holes are? And she said, well, there, I have holes in my pelvis. So education about anatomy here is in order to dispel the dysfunctional beliefs that her pelvis is really fragile. You can give pain education based on the answers people give on the illness perception questionnaire. The illness perception questionnaire is really quite short and consists of nine questions that people can answer. And this gives a really good basis to start a discussion with your patient on their beliefs. The third generation uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is acceptance and commitment therapy, also called ACT. In ACT, pain is not a problem, but it's considered that the attempts to avoid or eliminate pain can cause the true suffering. So basic tenets are diffusion, distancing and letting go of unhelpful beliefs, thoughts and memories, acceptance, is acknowledging painful feelings, sensations, and urges and allowing them to pass without struggling to avoid or eliminate them, except the fact that you have pain, and contact with the present moment, being present in the here and now and engaging each moment with openness and curiosity or mindfulness. ACT is quite, it's quite a cognitive therapy. So if you have patients that uh, have difficulty with, with cognition, then a operant conditioning approach might be better. So the act psychological flexibility is at the core. And if I, that means that being present in the, in the present moment, determine what your values are, what matters to you, who is your ideal self, committed action, pursuing what is important to you, then the self is context observing experiences and not being caught up in them. Take some distance. Diffusion is create space for thoughts and feelings, kind of observing them without being engaged in them. 
and acceptance is that bad things happen to people and you're one of them and that's the way it just is. When a person is psychologically flexible, they will make decisions based on their values and long-term standing beliefs rather than on the immediate short-term emotions they're experiencing. So overall, achieve a better life. Still then, pain will interrupt activities. And I think that's where we come in as physios. This is the uh, veteran skill, which asks about how much does pain interfere with the activities you're doing. Um, this skill is quite nice. I'm not sure if it has been validated on non-veterans, but I thought I'd show you this anyway. Of course, there are quite a few theories on how pain might interrupt activities. The most well known is the fear avoidance model by Vly and, and friends, um, where a pain experience is thought to result in pain catastrophizing, which will lead to pain related fear, which will lead to avoidance and hypervigilance, and then to disuse, depression and disability. The Hasbring model, however, uh, supposes that there are avoiders but also persisters. There are people who avoid activities because of fear of pain, and there are people who will persist in doing activities despite pain. And of course, there's also a group of people who are able to find a flexible balance between avoidance and endurance. In this study by Hörne et al., they looked at subgrouping patients' chronic low back pain and whether you can classify patients as an avoider or persister based on accelerometer data. And they were not able to find a difference between the two groups based on objective measurements. Andros, on the other hand, found some preliminary support for the validity of overactivity. They conducted a five-day observational study to investigate the validity of overactivity. And it seems in that study there was found uh, preliminary evidence that it does exist. One of the key questions is though, are patients more or less active than mass controls? They tell us they're less active, but are they really? So one of the first studies that was done on this topic was by Janine Verbund and colleagues and they looked at doubly labeled water and physical activity. And they found no statistical difference whatsoever between patients and controls. In the next study by Spenkelink, they used a 24 hour monitor, an accelerometer on patients with chronic low back pain. And you can see that the there is some difference between chronic low back pain patients and controls where the chronic low back pain patients have a relative longer time lying down, especially in the evening. But otherwise, the total amount of activity is the same. They also seem to walk slower than controls. As you can see here. And in Van Wering at all, they looked again at patients between patients with chronic low back pain and controls, and they found no difference uh, in total activity levels, but a little bit of difference in the activity over the day. We can see that patients are slightly more active in the morning and less active in the evening than healthy controls. And friends who monitored chronic low back pain patients for five days, and even though they found no difference in total activity, they found that avoiders have lower uptime than persisters. And again, in total activity, there is no difference. 
Ryan looked at the chronic low back pain patients compared to healthy controls and found that there's less activity for chronic low back pain patients and they take fewer steps and walk slower than healthy controls. Mainly they take less steps in the evening. Looking at a systematic review, looking at daily physical activities of patients with chronic pain, we found inconclusive evidence. In this study, it was the question was, do patients with chronic low back pain have an altered level and or pattern of physical activity compared to healthy individuals? And the answer here was also that patients with chronic low back pain had a significantly higher overall level of physical activity in the morning compared to controls. And patients with low back pain are significantly less active in the evening. So it seems that the movement pattern over the day is different between the groups. The conclusion was that the level of physical activity is inconclusive, but there appears to be a different, dis different distribution of physical activity over the day. So one of the hypotheses in the past has been, do patients decondition over time? If they are not physically active, then deconditioning should be the result and that is something that we could possibly measure. So in this review, we looked at the conditioning and whether there's any evidence that patients with chronic pain are. We found nine studies that were all cross-sectional and the evidence was conflicting. So no clear evidence of the conditioning either. We then followed up with another systematic review on the conditioning and chronic low back pain and found no evidence for deconditioning. So basically we're finding that objective physical activity levels are not different from healthy controls. There's some evidence for slower walking and taking fewer steps, and there's some evidence for different activity distribution over the day, more in the morning, less in the evening. The difference between avoiders and persisters is not overwhelming, but there's some evidence. The problem is that people have used different accelerometers, different methodologies, and different measures. The, the sample sizes are mostly small, and it's only been on chronic low back pain patients, and most of the studies have been done in the Netherlands. So really, the evidence that patients have a different physical activity level from health controls is really quite slim. So then why do we think that patients are less active than controls? I think it has to do with how we've measured physical activity. We have in the past been measuring physical activity with subjective means by self-report. We've used the, the BAC, the IPAC, the squash, human activity profile, etc. These questionnaires where people self-report. The objective measures are, have been introduced more lately, even though in my opinion not enough, and we're getting more and more studies now on accelerometers. They can be uniaxial, where they do step counts, or triaxial, where they measure in three different directions. Pedometers are a variant on accelerometers, and we can also observe patients to see what they are doing over a day. So do the objective measures and the subjective measures give the same answer? Well, not really. In the study from von Wiering, they compared the accelerometer data with the back of physical activity questionnaire. And the correlation was 0.27 for patients, whereas in health controls, the correlation was much better. And they concluded that 44% of the patients were really not aware of the activity levels and 30% of patients reported themselves as less active than they were in real life, and only 4% reported themselves as more active than they were in real life. 
So there's a discrepancy between what patients perceive their activity to be and reality. And so feedback on their physical behavior may be useful. Heine also looked at uh, an electronic diary compared to an acceler accelerometer. And he looked at the association between self-report and objective physical activity. And he found a moderate association. He found no association between pain intensity or depression with objective physical activities. And pain intensity was not associated with subjective physical activity. And people with higher depression self-rated physical activity lower. So people who have a depression think they do less than they actually do. Carvalho also looked at uh, the correlations between the fear of movement, disability and pain intensity and found that self-reported physical activity and fear of, move, fear of movement, disability and pain, that the correlations were quite low. This systematic review looked at the relationship between physical activity and disability and low back pain and found a moderate and negative relationship of mi minus 33, where higher disability was associated with lower physical activity. Not very surprising, I'm afraid. But when you look at the associations of physical activity and disability, you can see that the studies where uh, physical activity was measured objectively, the correlations were lower than where they were measured subjectively. So patients with chronic pain may have difficulties estimating their own physical activity in daily life. When I go exercising, I think I look like this, but I may actually look like this. I'm, I'm actually quite sure I look like this. For pain patients, they may actually think they look like this, whereas they really look like that. Question is now, what do we do? There's a discrepancy between objective and subjective measures. Patients say they have low levels of physical activity, but we really don't know if that's true or whether that's perception. Objective measurements give no relationship with fear avoidance, no relationship with pain intensity, and a small relationship with disability at best. So now what? I think we really need to better understand physical activity behavior and match accelerometers with, um, well, for instance, an experience sampling method or a diary to see what the relationship is with their physical activity levels and things like um, pain intensity and depression. Until then, the jury is still out on what we can best do with our patients. Thank you so much for listening and I hope this has been helpful.